Fundamentals. Yep, the title's Electrical Fundamentals, and today we're going to be talking about these uh, four things up in here. So let me ask you, what's the smallest thing that you know of? Atoms. Yeah, atoms are pretty small, okay, so uh, actually you could go deeper into it, but we're not going to go that far into quarks and things like that. But just let's talk about the, what you know about an atom. What's it made up of? Neutrons, electrons, protons. Yeah. All right, so you got the neutrons and protons, which you just yelled out to me was probably the nucleus. It's going to be in the center. And then uh, what you got on the outside? The electrons. So you know the basics, okay? So look, that's all you really need to know. I'm not, I don't need to make you all masters of science or anything like that. You just need to know the basics of the atom because these electrons are what I'm going to base the rest of the electricity lesson on. So you got to understand that these electrons, and then they got the rules, right? They got like two go on the first ring. All right, so that you know that there's, as soon as they get filled up with the rings, they move beyond and make further rings. Further rings go on. You don't have to write any of this. I'll tell you the important stuff to write. Okay, if this is the first time you're hearing this. Uh, you might we might go back and get together and just write some notes. But for most of you, you've heard this in science, maybe in the sixth grade, maybe in the uh, sometime here at Edison, uh, but you never know. So we can take these atoms and we can take similar types like all these gold atoms and make an element like gold. Or you can take combinations of the atoms and form a molecule or a compound. For example, the most, what's the most common compound everybody talks about all the time? Oxygen. Yeah, so that's an element. You got one, okay, so you got oxygen. And then what? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide's one. But we talk about what? Water. Water. Water's kind of like the standard. So if you look at an oxygen atom, it's got eight. Protons, neutrons, that's evened up in there. And then you got eight electrons orbiting around it. And it really doesn't orbit. Actually, it does this, uh, it like oscillates. It goes from one to the other, and it's kind of erratic, where it comes pretty close to the nucleus. And then it, I know this video just shows it spinning pretty evenly, like a moon around the planet, but it's not really that case. If you saw it, uh, and I saw a picture on the NASA channel one time where they videoed it, it's pretty random and erratic, these electrons orbiting around, what it looked like, you know. So now we got the, what's this one with only one? It's the lightest element that we know of. What's the lightest hydrogen. element? Hydrogen. Hydrogen's got one in the center, and then we got one electron spinning around. And then there's something that goes on when these things combine to form the compound. Now, you've got different kinds of bonds, all right? And I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, you know, you got an ionic bond, a covalent bond. Yeah, yeah. So that what's going to happen here, it's going to be one of those bonds to where they connect and fuse together, right? And they form a water molecule. So we got our two hydrogens that are going to form, and then you add the oxygen, and now we're going to get our moisture, our drop of water, all right? So look, this right here is just to show you that you can take them, and then they're going to reposition themselves on those electrons uh, so that they, uh, they form the one molecule of water. You got two hydrogen, two oxygen. But you understand that. So you got atoms molecules, and then we got compounds where we can take the things and, and uh, combine it. All right? And the compound that we use that is primarily, it was one of the words of the day, R22. All right? It's a hydrochlorofluorocarbon. All right? It's like a carbon, an H, a hydrogen, and then they got a couple chlorines and fluorines and things like that that combine together to form R22. So, uh, but it's bad. We can't use that anymore. So we could have water is one, R22 is another one. All right, and I want to talk about those electrons on the outside because when you have the number of electrons equal the number of proton neutrons in the center, that's a balanced charge. That's pretty much how everything is. It's balanced right away. But if you have one more than the other, for example, if you have more electrons than protons, then that's going to be a negatively charged element. Or if you have more protons than electrons, uh, then you're going to have a positively charged element. All right? That's all that's saying. So that's good. That's what we like. Here's a balanced charge here. Okay, so there's our water molecule. So let's say something uh, jolted one of the electrons out. Of the, uh, we can charge the water, believe it or not. You can, you can do something with water to make it charged. So what they do is they take away one of the electrons, and now it's unbalanced. So the water is positive right now. We got a positive charge because there's more of the pluses in the center than the electrons, the negatives outside in the rings. So we can do that. You could do this with your body, right? You ever done it with a balloon? You can charge up your body. You can kind of make the balloon, you rub it up against your head. What happens when you touch something then? Or what happens to your hair when you pull the balloon away? It sticks up. What kind of electricity is that? Because that's what, that's what you're doing. You're moving these electrons around. 
Static. static electricity. Yes. So you've seen this on some form, all right? Where it's all right. And then the other way is if you got an extra electron, all right, or you had more electrons and protons, that's a negatively charged molecule. So I don't need to go into how all that happens. Just that you know that when you have more out here, it's going to be negative, and when you have more in here, what's that going to be? Positive. positive. That's all you need to know. Positive and negative. Now look, conductors. Talked about gold. Gold's a very good conductor, one of the best. What, what are you guys using for your conductors on your electrical projects? What's all this stuff made out of? Copper. Copper. Copper's another good electron, uh, good, another good conductor, and I'll show you why. It's got a free electron on the outside of its, uh, of its atom. It's called a balance electron. And that balance electron, that free electron, makes a good conductor, right? So copper atoms, they got this extra one right here. Go ahead and jot it down. You don't need to do it exact, but I want you to put the nucleus in the center and write the word number 29, because there's 29 proton neutrons, and then draw four rings. The biggest one I want you to draw is on the outside edge with a negative, and I want you to label it. You got your neutrons, protons, electrons, and this one here is called a valence. This guy Volta came up with some of this stuff. All right, Volta, Volta. Now this is what's happening in the atom. When your copper wire you got millions, trillions, billions of these atoms up in here, right? And they all have this extra electron. And believe it or not, it's orbiting, but you can't see it. You can't feel it. This balanced electron is what we're going to use to conduct our electricity. All right? And I'm going to actually show you another, one, another slide with three of them. I'm going to show you. Hold on one second. If you're not done drawing it, I got another slide for you. So here's how the current's going to flow in the conductor. So I talked about positive negative charges. The one way to do it is do like that balloon, right? Static electricity. Take the balloon, rub it up against something. You could also do it if the air is really dry. Moisture will affect the static electricity. The more moisture in the air there is, the less chance of static electricity there is, which is why at your house in the wintertime when the heat's running, you kind of get shocked a lot more often than in the summertime when it's cool and humid. Okay, so the moisture will affect this right here, the friction, static electricity. Also, chemical batteries. What happens when the battery runs out? Yeah, no more power, right? That's it. You're not going to have the thing work. But what happens if you leave the battery in there for like two, three years? Anybody ever had a toy? They left the battery? Yes, yeah, some of the chemical can come out. Some of the chemical comes out, that alkaline comes out, that acid, that's bad. So the batteries is doing some problem. And you've seen that chemical. You actually might have even touched it at some point. But that chemical is going to create a reaction with those electrons, and that's what's going to generate our power, the electron flow. And then the most common way we use all our power, our power coming from here, power coming for the light, power all coming from those three big power lines that you see running along uh, some of the fields, those are done with magnetic induction. So there's a generator. There's some sort of power source. All right, so these are, and then there's more. When you did the type 1 test on fundamental, a unit 1 test, okay, that shows you, I think, two or three more. Do you remember any of them? There's two other ways you could generate electricity. One is with a crystal. Do you see that? You take a crystal and you crush it. And when you crush the crystal, a uh, little bit of voltage will come out like quartz. You take quartz and you crush it under high pressure, it'll create a small amount of electricity. Also does something with time where they can get the frequency. The other thing is, is uh, heat, all right? When you have heat and I take two different metals and I heat them up, all right, they call those two different metals bimetals. When you put flame to some certain bimetals, it creates a small amount of voltage too. It'll create a little bit of mini millivolts. So there's a couple other ways besides these three. But we're just gonna talk about these three right now. All right, so here we go. I got three copper atoms, and I took something like uh, some power, and I jolted that valence electron to push it down to the next atom. Well, now that created a free space here, so it's negatively charged, and this one that's positive compared to that one will bounce positive to negative over to the other side. All right, so that electron now is going to go from one to the other, all right, and it'll go and hit the space. I think I did too much there on that. Yep, it's going too fast. Let's see. Boom, boom. All right, so let's see if we can do it again. Boom, let's charge that one up, and boom, it's out. So now what's going to happen is this one's going to hop over, and this one's going to hop over, and this one's going to hop over. Well, there'll be one more back here somewhere to hop over. This is how the electricity's flowing in the wire. And if it's direct current, 
It's just going one way until the battery dies. But alternating current, the stuff that Tesla come, came up with, right? Remember I showed you that video up here? What's his deal? AC, which is alternating. So it just doesn't go one way. It actually goes about five atoms to the right. And then with his current, the way his magnet worked, it drew all the current back another five spaces to the left. And then when the magnet, the generator spun again, it spun it five steps to the right. And it just kept going back and forth like that. Has everybody finished drawing that and labeled this one? What is that one called? Copper. That's all, yeah, the whole atom's copper, but that extra, that 29th electron, what do they call that? Uh, the valence. The valence. So we'll talk more about the difference between alternating and direct current in a minute. Right now, I just want to make sure that we understand the difference between volts, amps and, amps, and ohms. But take a look here. So this would be like my battery. I got all my electrons stored right here. So if I turn this upside down, right, now my electrons are flowing for positive over here to negative, going back. And then eventually, what's going to happen with this, though? It's going to run out. Just like a battery will run out of electrons. So then I'd have to take it and change out, put a new battery in. Or in this case, I can just turn it upside down, and we can get the flow to go again. So that's like DC current. It's only going to go one way, from positive to negative, from top to bottom. Now alternating current, those electrons aren't just going one way. I got a positive on this side, a negative on this side, and this is like that one electron, that valence electron on the outside of the copper atom. So what happens with alternating current is the electron's going to move to the left, to the right, to the left, to the right, just like that. That's how they're moving. And that's generating what I need to make power for, usually we're changing this power to something like heat or light or some works being done, right? So we're changing this energy and you can't destroy it. Like all that energy, I, all I did was transfer it from one to another. Some you actually saw with the physical movement. Some was a little bit of heat generated when the balls smacked into each other. But you can't really tell, it did, all right? So some of it's, no, none of the energy I did just created it, right? It just, all it did was transfer it from one, one thing to another. And in this case, uh, we're going to be using it a lot for light. So that's it, this balance electron, that's what we're doing. So you got some things that we got to talk about. Ohm's law, all right? Go ahead and write this down. Ohm's law says that it will take one volt, push one amp through one ohm of resistance. That's kind of like our BTU where it says we got, you know, one pound of water, you want to raise it one degree Fahrenheit, you're going to need one BTU's worth of heat. So they kind of keep these rules pretty simple. So one volt, volt is our power, it's our, it's our force, right? And amp is going to be like those electrons flowing in the wire. The faster they move from one atom to the another, what do you think is going to happen with the amps? The faster they move, all right? Or the more electrons I'm moving in the wire, what's, what do you think is going to happen to that flow? You think it's going to go down? So when you run faster, your energy goes down. No, it's going up. No. Uh, yeah, you go up. Yes, it goes up. The flow goes up. The faster it's flowing, the more energy it has, and it's actually generating a magnetic field. You can't see it, but it's happening. All right. So electromotive force, hey, that's another word for volt. Elect and that's something that Volta came up with. The electromotive force, they use that as energy. Instead of that, write all this down. I should see everybody's little fingers writing, right? Electromotive force, and another way of saying this Ohm's law is the EMF equals intensity, which that's the current flow, amperage, times the ohms, resistance. Or I could write it like this, E equals I times R or E equals IR, without the times in there, but you know that when they're right next to each other, you're going to multiply it. Electromotive force, they're going to symbol that as E. So when you see the E, really what that means is voltage, voltage. And that's the pressure. That's the force of the power pushing through. And then you got the intensity. How fast is it flowing? That's the amperage. And then you got the resistance which we measure in ohms, and they have a symbol here, the Greek symbol for omega, which is what you'll see on all of our meters. But in the pie chart, you will see R. 
So E means voltage, I means amperage, and R means resistance. You got all that written down, Deb? And aside from a light being on, the only way that you can read voltage, amperage, or resistance is with a digital meter. So like this one here, it's got two different things to it. It's got my test leads, which I could use this to measure voltage. So I can shove it in the outlet here, turn the meter on the highest setting. Usually you start with the highest setting for safety. And then we shove it in the outlet here one at a time. And the better thing would be to put it in here, but then I can't hold it up. So, but I can have one hand really just being right there like that, and you can hear the beeping. But I can't show it to you when I do that, so I'll shove it in. That's voltage. I need the leads for that. The other thing I can measure, I put it over here on AC amps, is amperage. But I'm going to need just one wire, because you can only measure amperage in one wire, right? If I got this uh, wire, if I could break that down and split the wire open, I could clip this wire right here around that little hook. And what that's going to do is this is going to read that magnetic field. There's a magnetic field that's going all around the wire when power is applied. And the more power and the more current there is, the bigger the magnetic field, the bigger the number is going to show up here. And then the last thing we use the meter for is to read resistance. And that is measured in ohms. And they have another thing that measures continuity, meaning that I have a continuous loop. All this will only work as if the only time it will ever come together and you can get all this stuff to work is if you got a circuit. And a circuit is you got to have a power source, a conductor, and a load. What's a load? Give me an example of a load. Switch is the control. Don't need it. That's a good thing to have, but... Yes, a light. Light's a load. So for a complete circuit, all I need is power source. Could be a battery. Could be 120 volt. Could be, and then I need the conductors, right? So I can move those electrons and those atoms. And then I need something to do work, like in this case a light. Or it could be a pump. Or it could be a radio. Could be anything. But you need those three things to make it work. And when you do that, we're going to be talking about the volts that you need, the power source, the amount of current flowing through the wire, the amps, and your load's going to have a certain amount of resistance to it, whatever it is. And we can change this around a little bit so that it looks different. All right, so pretty much the same thing. We're back up to here. All right, so you got your E equals I times R. That's volts equals amps times resistance. Now, this is the toughest way to learn Ohm's Law. And I'm going to jump through about 10 slides. It has all the math. So you can see the easy way first, and then we'll go back and do some of the math. Yeah. Got it? Okay, so here's one way of writing it. All right, so all you got to do is, uh, when you're doing something else, just change it around a little bit. So if you wanted to find I, that's going to be the same thing as E. Don't write this down. E divided by R, and then if you needed to find R, then that would be I divided by E. It's all confusing. That's the worst way to do it. So let me go ahead and jump ahead a bunch of slides here. We're not going to look at the math yet. Don't worry about the math, but there is math. Welcome to the HVAC. It's going to be a lot of math now from this point on. It's just the way it is. Yeah, look at all this you got to figure out. Huh? You're getting a speed lesson on the map. Look at that. They're moving it all around. All right. Oh, they're showing you now with actual load, with a circuit. And we got three different examples to go over. All right, so here's the best way to learn it. See the disc? Go ahead and draw the disc. You've seen this before in electrical, right? No, Someone showed me how it before. Someone showed you at work? Yeah. But you didn't do this in Polizzi's class? Yeah. We do it at the book. Yeah, yeah, we do the book. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, 
app of the month is called Omulator. So if you go on your iTunes or whatever Android account, you need to find the Omulator because you're going to need it. Not right now. We're going to do them by manual hand first with uh, your calculators. But eventually, uh, coming up later in class, you're going to need to have that app for my assignments that I have going on for you with the Omulator. So here's the same way to do it, what you just saw in all those words. So look, if I needed to find I, I cover up I, and that's going to be in order for me to find that, what is I, by the way? What would we say I was? Intensity. Intensity, but what does that mean on my meters? Amps. Amps, yeah, okay. So that's going to be volts divided by resistance, ohms. So if I needed to find out what the amp drawing is, in other words, I need to know what wire run for these three lights. All right, and let's say this one pulls 10 kilowatts, that one pulls 10 kilowatts, and that one, I need to know how much amps, all right, if each one of these pulls 10 kilowatts of power, uh, how much, how, what size wire to run, all right, because I can't run the wire, and then, uh-oh, this is too big for the wire, and now the wire's going to burn up and catch the house on fire. So we have to do some of this math to figure out some of our stuff for our heating supply. So let's go ahead and let's just use one real quick. Let's just say you got uh, something that's reading 12, Mm. Ah, she's not working today. All right, that's not going to work. So let's say I can do it over here. Let's say that you got something that your voltage is uh, 120. All right, and your resistance is going to be 10 ohms. All right, what is going to be the current, the I, the amperage flowing through the wire? So you need to find I, cover it up. What are you going to do? 12. Uh, it's 12. Divided by... Yep. 120 divided by 10 equals 12 amps. So yes, that's one way of figuring it out. Or let's say you know what the amperage was, right? So amps right here is 12 amps. Let's say you knew what the amperage was and the resistance. Uh, let's say you're given a resistance of, um, let's say, 5 ohms. Okay, we're doing another problem here. And uh, let's say you were given the resistance, so the current flow is 20 amps. What was the voltage then? 100. How'd you get that? Yes, so now you don't, we need to know what the V is, or the E, same thing. Cover it up, and I times R is right next to it. So yes, so yes, yes, five, you got it on the money. Five times 20 amps equals 100 volts. Okay. See how we're using Ohm's Law to figure this stuff out? Now there's three types of circuits. There's a capacitive circuit, there's an inductive circuit, and there's a resistive circuit. This really only works with resistive circuits, and we'll talk about all those circuits a little bit later. But this one here, this is what we're going to be using to measure for our heat, and uh, you're actually going to be doing this with the first project a little bit because your light, light's a resistive circuit. That actually works out pretty good. So to find voltage, just cover up E. All right, so go ahead and write that down. To find voltage, this is what you're going to need. This is the formula you're going to need for. Yes, yes, for the rest of your life, it's some of the smaller stuff. It's funny, I just read an article on uh, about the conference I went to, and that guy that handles all the certification tests for the instructors said that a lot of the instructors were missing some of the basic stuff. They're great in the field, but a lot of this basic knowledge, in fact, you know, I couldn't tell you how much I didn't know that I thought I knew when I started teaching, when you start cracking that book open, right? The little things that you kind of miss, and that's what this guy was saying in his article, was the fact that uh, a lot of the instructors coming out of the field need to go back and crack that book so they can get some of these basics down. So that's one way of doing it. And then we got to get, uh, let's say, to find the current. Which one's current again? I. I. Yep, you got it. So we're going to cover up the I. So to find current, that's going to be E divided by R because it's over it. It's over it. What the? And what's the last one then? Bar. Yep, to find the resistance, what's that going to be? E divided by I. You got it. So it's not that hard, right? It's not that hard to find one or the other. All you got to do is cover it up. So knowing this now, 
I'm going to go back to those slides and show you the math, okay? Because this is a better way of doing it. If you can just draw the pie, you don't need to remember all the math. You can just cover up whatever one you're looking for, and that will help you see what's left to figure out the problem. So let me see here. I'm missing my smart board. Uh, all right, so let's look at the math. So that's it. That's the same thing. What we just saw with the pie chart, only it's written. I don't like the written stuff. I like to show you. Okay, so pretty much, look, you see how they're getting both sides the same? Let me see if I can do it. The math behind Ohm's Law, so you got that. So we got, we got, we know that we got 10 volts, and you got 2 amps, and 5 ohms. All right, so you got all those resistance, and you're going you're gonna to be given 2 of the 3. So they must have known amps and ohms over there, so they can figure out volts, which is the same thing we did. Same thing that Sam or Ray, I can't remember who it was, but somebody just said, hey, you just multiply it. And that gives you your voltage. So that's what they did here. And they're just showing it to you, step by step. So if I wanted to find the amps, that's going to be, what's that going to be? How do I find amps? Look at your pie. Oh, you got to divide uh, the volts. The volts divide. So you got. We want to find amps, but the volts is over here, and the resistance is there. So you got to divide it. Yes. So they're gonna. That's what they're gonna do. They're gonna divide both by the same number. So that crosses this out, right? All right. And then that's left with ten fifths up here. So ten fifths. How many times five go into ten? Two. Yeah. Two. Okay. So that's how they're doing the math. I'll just do that a little slow for you there, because not everybody's the math. This is what they're doing. They're figuring it out by doing this math here. And then the last one is for ohms. So we got five ohms, or the, they don't know what the ohms is. We got 10 volts, two amps. So we got to find the ohms. That's what the formula would look like. So what are they going to divide by? Yeah, but what are they going to divide by number-wise? Uh, two. Two. To make it, yeah, to get rid of that two on this side, they'll divide both sides by two, and that's how they'll get rid of it. Yeah, that's the simple math. Thank you. <laughs> simple math. But you, hey, you would not be surprised how many people mess up on the simple math. Why? Yes, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. My daughter's doing fractions. My my wife was this morning going, remember when the numbers are on the bottom the same, number on the top's bigger? You know, and she's in the fourth grade, and she's just running all this math. So, yes, you're right. This is fourth grade simple math. But a lot of people don't work with fractions a lot. So let's see, Mr. Simple Math, if you can get this problem right. Nobody answer but Fahad, because he's like Simple Math Man. All right. Wait, let's, we're skipping ahead. This is the easy step we already did. We're skipping ahead. Hold on one second. All right, here we go. We're giving you the live circuit. We need to know the voltage. The resistance is 24 ohms. So I read on my meter here, my ohms, 24 ohms. So normally we'd have the circuit disconnected from the power and the whatever I'm measuring for resistance that component would be isolated so I disconnect the wires so I measured right here and here with my meter and I read 24 ohms and then I clipped it around the wire with the power on and I'm reading 5 amps well what is the voltage what does that mean five simple math oh you multiply so you get uh, uh, 120 120 how many agree I agree I concur so yes, you multiply. Very good, Fahad. Simple math. You got it, huh? A little tough. All right, let's do the next one. Who thinks they can do the next one? Oh, you, Sam? All right, number two. So we got a different one here. Oh, we know the voltage. We know the resistance. What's the amp draw going to be when I clip my meter around? Oh. It's going to be at 12. 12, 12, I heard the first, second, and third, 12. Last one, who wants it? Huh, you? All right, Brian, Mr. Jones. Last one. So this one here, probably gonna have to find the current. So you got the voltage. Oh, you gotta find the ohms. Oh, it's a tough one, 0.83. Yeah, you're gonna have to crack out the calculator. But what are you gonna do with it? Divide. Man, you guys are Ohm's Law masters, right? So I can give you some practice problems and you can probably do them on your own real quick. Some Ohm's Law practice problems. Yeah, please, please. Please, please? Okay. All right, let's go ahead and do that. I'll give you some practice problems. You can work on them on your own for a minute. 